Hey, it's Pat Bellavo here again, everyone. Um, just to have something, another thing to get down on video to document and to share with you. Um, this goes back to the early nineties again. Uh, it's, it, it involves the Dorsey tour that I, Jimmy Dorsey tour I did. It doesn't, the main premise of it is not that specifically, but, uh, this kind of comes about because of that tour. So, um, it'll explain itself as we go along. So anyway, I'm just going to jump right into it. And, uh, if there's any other stuff, details that, uh, to add, I'll do that as I go. All right. So this was posted on Facebook, April 8th, 2020. A couple of posts ago, I posted a video of one of my favorite contemporary jazz drummers, Peter Erskine. And along with Peter, another one of my favorite contemporary jazz drummers, I can't have just one. Actually, I've got, yeah, I've got a bunch. But anyway, um, is Paul Wertico. Paul played drums in the Pat Metheny group from 1983 to 2001, earning seven Grammys while doing so. I brought Paul up from Chicago to Calgary in 1997 to play on my first CD, my first solo CD. It's hard to believe it was 23 years ago. Um, as I mentioned a few stories ago, one of the albums I was listening to religiously while on tour, whether it was in the bus, in an airport, on a plane, wherever really, was Matheny's Letter from Home. On the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra Tour, about three quarters of the way through our tour schedule, we pulled into Chicago with a day off and then a concert just south in Joliet, Illinois. If you remember the Blues Brothers, uh, Jake Blues... Joliet, Jake. Yeah. J uh, Joliet, I think is about, I think it's about 20 miles or 30 miles south of Chicago. It's got a, a prison <laughs> there, which is of course where, um, where John Belushi and, and, uh, Dan Aykroyd were supposedly, uh, incarcerated anyway. And in Joliet at a beautiful theater, beautiful old theater called the Rialto, if I remember correctly. And it was a, some of these theaters I played in on these tours were absolutely amazing, uh, especially the older ones, just almost palatial the way that they looked. It was, it was quite something. And the funny things that we did, at, this is an aside from what I posted, but some of the things that we did and what all the bands that were going through there were doing was uh, we would sign the, the um, either the walls in marker or the, they had like a drop ceiling. So we would sign the panels our individual names and what we were doing there and stuff. And I saw a whole bunch of different uh, artists and groups that went through the, these particular theaters. It was quite something. It was neat. It was neat to see all the people that had gone through these theaters. So somewhere in these, these old theaters that were doing that and stuff, and even some of the new ones, my name is etched on roof panels or walls or something somewhere. Anyway, going way back to the early 90s. Anyway, the Los Angeles office of Columbia Artist Management took care of all the logistics of the tour and booked us into a neat old hotel on Michigan Avenue called the Allerton, which reminded me a lot of a hotel we have here in downtown Calgary called the Palliser. Now, Columbia Artist Management, uh, they booked the tours for us. It has nothing to do with Columbia Records or Columbia Pictures. It's its only thing. It's its own thing. Uh, they had... They still have a New York office and they had um, an LA office and the LA office was booking everything for all the tours I did. They ended up probably about three years after, two or three years after I finished touring, they shut the LA office down and now everything uh, is based out of New York now. So anyway, um, talking about the, the hotel, the Allerton, after getting settled in my room, me and a couple of my bandmates walked out the door. I looked to my left, and there it stood, the awning that would change my life and perspective about pizza forever. It read, Gino's East, Chicago Deep Dish Pizza. Okay, I'm going to need a minute to pause and reflect. Okay, I'm back. And no shit, my stomach is growling. <laughs> Actually, it's not, but... That was some killer pizza. And, and I think that was the first time I had ever had, uh, in fact, it was the first time I'd had um, authentic Chicago deep dish. Hello. So after much destruction and debauchery with pizza, we all kind of split up from there to go to the various places we wanted to, 
and I found myself at a neat little jazz club on East Hubbard Street called Andy's, and there was a quartet playing with an alto saxophonist fronting the group. I don't say this in there, but I think, I think the alto saxophonist was Mike Smith, who is a fellow that I ended up meeting later uh, when I joined Cowworth because Mike uh, was in charge of playtesting all the horns that came into North America from Germany. Uh, the Calworth factory is, was about, I think, 30 miles south of Frankfurt. And Mike uh, is based in Chicago, of course. And the Boozy and Hawks um, head office, and Boozy and Hawks was the parent company of Calworth, was based in Libertyville, Illinois, which was a northern suburb of Chicago. They since moved out to California. But Mike play tested all the instruments that came in from, from Germany into North America. So, And I'm pretty certain it was him. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that it was. Um, the group sounded really good. And I found myself regularly drawn to what the drummer was doing and how well he was holding down the time at any tempo. After hanging there for a couple of sets, I got up to pay my bill and grab a souvenir shirt and the cashier asked me what I thought of the group. And I replied, they sound fantastic, but I have to admit, I'm really knocked out by the drummer. I couldn't stop focusing on what he was doing. She then said, oh yeah, that's Paul Wertico. And I said, I know that name from the Pat Metheny group. She said, yep, that's him. He lives in the Chicago area. To which I replied, well, no wonder I was checking him out so much. I told her I was on a three-month USA tour, and I had been wearing out my Matheny recordings, especially Letter From Home. I can't remember if I ever told Paul that story or not of when I first heard him in a live setting, but that's where it was. I also remember going to another venue located on Michigan Avenue in the Blackstone Hotel, and it was called Joel Siegel's Jazz Showcase. That night, the vibraphonist Gary Burton was there with his group, which was also fantastic. Wow, my, uh, <laughs> my computer's going crazy. Okay, uh, interesting. I also brought Paul up to Calgary and Banff in April of 2008, I think it was, as a guest drummer soloist with the Primetime Big Band, as well as to do a master class at the Rocky Mountain Music Festival held at the Banff Center for the Performing Arts, a festival that attracts about 6,000 students each year from across Canada and the Western USA. As it turned out, we had some of the Bob Kernow Big Man arrangements of the Pat Metheny Group songs in our book, and of course, they were perfect to have Paul play on with us, well, duh, as well as some Buddy Rich repertoire, etc. Bob Kernow, if I'm not mistaken, was a trombonist who played with the Stan Kenton Orchestra, and um, uh, he's a staff writer for Sierra Music Publications, and he did a whole bunch of Pat Metheny Group um, I guess transcriptions or arrangements, whatever, for big band. And we had a small handful of them in our repertoire with the primetime band. So of course it was perfect for Paul to play on because he, he played on most of those recordings, if not all of them. So anyway, from Buddy Rich's book, one of the songs we played for the students, and there was a two concerts of about 900 students, teachers, and parents in each concert was John LaBarbera's Dancing Men. About three quarters of the way through the chart, there was a drum solo. <laughs> Imagine that, a Buddy Rich band chart with a drum solo in it. Go figure. And Paul launched into what must have been a 10 or 15 minute rather insane drum solo using brushes, sticks, metal chains, and long plastic hollow tubes, hitting not only all drums and cymbals at his disposal, but pretty much all rims, cymbal stands, and even a couple of stainless steel plate lids that you get when you order room service. There was some food backstage for us, which is where he got them from. I imagine you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever ordered room service in a hotel, they'll bring the plates up and then you have these, these metal stainless steel lids on top of them. He smuggled a couple out on stage and he just put them down on the, on the, um, on the drum heads of his toms and just started playing those. And it was actually quite a neat, uh, quite a neat transition from just the regular drum set to, it had some really neat, uh, colors and, and sounds and stuff to it. So that was pretty cool. Um, after his solo was done, we finished out the song and the crowd pretty much lost their shit. <laughs> they did. Students 
came up to the stage and were banging their hands on the stage and screaming and cheering. That's probably the closest I'll ever get to feeling like one of the Beatles in the 1960s. Anyway, it was certainly a most memorable event to be part of, and I will remember it for a very long time. It was a sincere, it was a sincere pleasure to have him up here, and I hope we can get him back up here again sooner than later. Oh, and about that, stay tuned. In other words, I'm working on it. And then I post um, a uh, link to Pat Metheny Group doing the First Circle. Probably my favorite Pat Metheny Group tune. I mean, I have a bunch, but that's probably, if I had to pick one, that's probably the one I would pick. And that one is um, recorded live in Japan. Uh, I think it was mid-90s, something like that. Um, I have the the DVD that goes with it too. So, um, it's very cool. I love that tune and, uh, primarily in 22, eight time, which is, it's interesting how something can be so melodic and, and just sit so well and feel so good. That's in 22, eight time among other time signatures too. It kind of moves around, but anyway, so yeah, I brought Paul up to record my first solo album in 1997 and, um, it was great having him on board, not because he's a really great drummer. And I had him play a bunch of different styles for me. I had him playing a funk thing. Um, I had one tune that was, a, that was an original, and I think I put on the on the page, Matheny Bossa Feel. I figured he would know exactly what I'm talking about when I did that. And, of course, he nailed it. And what was also very cool about having him there was I gave him co-producer credit on the on the liner notes, too, because he was just he was a very uh, valuable um, additional set of ears in the control room and uh, was really helpful uh, in the, in the production part, like just to, to um, as far as the recording session part was concerned that, and he had, of course, with the kind of music he's been exposed to and playing and all that stuff. I mean, his ears were huge, right? So, so he really was an asset to have, not only as a drummer and, and doing the things he did, but also from that standpoint where, um, that was that extra set of finely tuned ears to, um, you know, help make decisions and things like that. So that was very cool. So anyway, yeah, that's, um, that's something I wanted to share with you and, Um, it's funny, 23 years later, he and I are still in contact, which is great. As a matter of fact, like I said, I'm trying to work on bringing him up here again. So, um, it's always nice to reconnect with him and, and, um, I follow him on, on Faceplant and see what he's doing and all that kind of stuff. So definitely a world-class musician and a great guy. So anyway, uh, that's the main, uh, story and all that stuff regarding that. It's fairly short and sweet, but anyway, just wanted to share that with you too, and as well as document this for my video library here. So, so I'm going to, as my dear departed father used to say, pull a Hank Snow and be moving on. Uh, so, um, thank you for your time and thank you for sticking through these 13 minutes and 30 seconds. And, uh, just a reminder, I will post my, um, email address for this YouTube channel down below here. It's YouTube at belltones.ca. I will post it below. If you have any questions, comments, topics, suggestions, anything like that, please don't be afraid to send me a message. That'll be great. And I will definitely respond to you. Um, but like I said, in in one of the previous videos, unless you're a freak and you send me some weird stuff or you spam me, and then I will just push delete and that'll be that. So I don't want to have to do that. So I'm very happy to correspond with you if if, uh, if um, you want to send me questions, comments, or topic suggestions or anything like that. So, okay, that's about all for now, guys and gals. So hope all is going well for you and have a great night and tomorrow and next week and isolation and all that stuff. Take care and bye for now.